Good evening and welcome to worship on this Ash Wednesday. I'm Bob Fuchs, I'm the pastor here at Down River Church and we're worshiping in person here at 14400 Beach Daily and also we're streaming live on Facebook and so I welcome everyone to worship this evening. And uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, we will be uh, imposing ashes that's the terminology uh, for those of you in the room and what we'll do when this that'll be the last thing we do as worship at worship and we'll be leaving in silence and I'll meet you at the back door and that's where I can impose the ashes now if you're worshiping at home we didn't send ashes home or send you tattoos so if you have a magic marker or a pen and you want to mark a cross on your hand I would invite you to do that if you want to find a little bit of ashes and, and put it with oil, you can do that as well. Uh, we don't recommend water because that can become caustic. Uh, but we invite you to take part in this Ash Wednesday as we enter into Lent. Uh, so this evening, uh, Megan Finley is going to be offering our uh, call to worship responsibly, as well as reading our scripture. And our music director, Tim Robbins, uh, will be joined by uh, Gail Bricky, Colleen Mady, and Bill Curtis, and they will lead us in song. And I invite you now to stand as you're able, and Megan, please come up and share our call to worship. Why have we gathered in this place? We come in praise of the God of all life in affirmation of Jesus Christ as the truth and center of our lives. We celebrate places where love is found, life, and we give thanks for the gift of the new life that comes to us this Lenten season. Now if you would please stand and join in singing Sanctuary. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 51, verses 1 through 17, from the Common English Bible. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin, because I know my wrongdoings. My sin is always right in front of me. I've sinned against you, you alone. I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you render your verdict, completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, I was born guilty in sin from the moment of my mother conceived me. And yes, you want the truth in the most hidden places. You teach me wisdom in the most secret places, spaces. 
Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for me, God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside me. Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Return the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach wrongdoers your ways and sinners will come back to you. Deliver me from violence, God, God of my salvation, so that my tongue can sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. You don't want sacrifices. If I gave you an entirely burned offering, you wouldn't be pleased. A broken spirit is my sacrifice, God. You won't despise a heart, God, that is broken and crushed. Thank you, Megan. Many years ago when I lived in Grand Rapids and I was starting out my career, I worked in the downtown area. And there was a, a small pub nearby, and uh, I, I still remember the name of it and their little tagline. It was called The Mood. And on their sign it said, The Mood, Booze, Choose, C-H-E-W-S. And I see I had to explain it, because you can't see it in front of you. But that was their tagline, and we would go there for lunch. And we got to know the, the bartender and the wait staff there and the owner, and so, Went to lunch one time, ordered. You paid when you were at the bar, and so I got my lunch and paid. And when I was walking back to my seat, I noticed that I had been given too much change. And I put it in my pocket. And I kept it. Didn't say anything. Sat down, you know, finished my meal. And as we're leaving, I walk by the bar. Hey, take care. See you soon. Bob. Yeah? You gonna give me the money back? I said, excuse me, the money? Yeah, the extra change I gave you. What? Really, Bob? I know I gave you extra change. I did it on purpose. I saw you count it on your way back to your seat. Embarrassed doesn't quite hit the mark. I gave the money back, and then I got thinking, wait a minute, how often do you do this? And actually it was something that he had started doing on a regular and recurring basis. And what he told me was he couldn't tell what the person was going to do just by looking at them. Could be a suit, could be somebody in jeans and a t-shirt that he did it with. And he said about half kept the money and half gave it back. I was on the wrong side of that list. It taught me something, though. And since that day, if I'm given too much change, I don't keep it. It goes back. If I get charged too much, I tell them. If I get charged too little, I tell them. This has stuck with me for the rest of my life. And here we are, as we look at the world, try as we may, each one of us, right? We fall short sometimes, don't we? Anybody here? If everybody's hand isn't up, then I'll come out and help you. <laughs> and, and we don't, sometimes it's not out of, you know, it's out of less than pure motives. We may be trying to get away with something. We may be trying to take advantage of another person. And it's not always conscious. Sometimes it happens by accident and we don't realize that we did it. And, and, and if I were to go around the room and say, give me some examples of things that you've slipped up on. You could give me specific situations. You could tell me what others have done to you. Right? We're good at that. We remember those. And we could go on and on and look at it and and say, okay, but those aren't all that big. You know, most of them, are, but when it comes right down to it, no matter how big or small, there's a word for that. It's called sin. 
And as we gather together here for Ash Wednesday, that is part of our focus is our sin and what is inside of us and what is present in this world. As much as we'd like to say, God, you created this world perfect, and then you put humans in it, and man, have we messed it up. And it's sin that has done that. It's not us. It's sin that is causing this to happen. And we do it against others, and we do it against God. And we do it against ourselves as well. And see, that's what we sometimes have to admit to, that yes, this does happen, and when others point it out to us, it can hurt. But understand this, sin exists. Now, Megan, I appreciate the reading you did on this evening's psalm, because it is, it's a complex psalm. There's a lot going on. We hear confession. We hear acknowledgement of individual sin and sinful nature. We hear a, a plea for a, a forgiveness. We hear repentance. And we hear a desire to be reconciled with God. Now, if you're not familiar with the psalm, it, it's in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, and it is attributed to David, also known as King David. And it's written shortly after his friend, Nathan, points out to him about the situation David had found himself in. David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. She was pregnant. And David, in an attempt to cover this up, had her husband, Uriah, killed in battle. Sin piled on sin piled on sin. And so you can just hear that all-encompassing sin that is there. And right in the psalm, it says this, Yes, I was born in guilt in sin. That's what David writes. It's from conception. It's from when he was made. Sin is part of his identity. He doesn't want it to be, but it is. It's part of his defining nature. It's part of who he is as a human being. He says, all I know and all I am is sin. Those are strong statements from someone who was one of God's favorites. One of God's chosen. And when we look at the psalm, we can hear words and verbs. The verbs are wash, wipe, clean, purify. This is what David is asking. And all this points to something very dirty and very deep that he needs to be cleaned and purified. And what it is is it's sin. And David admits to it, that's the grime that needs to be treated. David is aware of this. Now, Nathan helped him out by focusing and helping David to see David's sins. And sometimes that is necessary. Others have to see it. But there are other times where we'll point out people's sins so we can take the heat off of our own. We don't want to be compliant with that. And whenever that happens, we have to turn to Jesus' words and what he told us when We're pointing at others and pointing out their sins. He was uh, there when a woman was accused of adultery. And the, the punishment is death by stoning. Throwing rocks at her until she's dead. And they asked Jesus, what do you think about this? And Jesus responded in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 7. He says this, whoever hasn't sin. Whoever has no sin should throw the first stone. Everyone there had sinned. They all wound up leaving and the woman was left alone with Jesus. Those without sin cast the first stone. It's no different today. None of us are without sin. We try to think that we are. We, we try to hide it. Some of us are better at that than others, or at least we think we are. God sees and knows. And Psalm 51 that we heard this evening, it reminds us that sin might be looked at as something external, something that's happening to us, something that we may be bringing into us. We may be eating too much. We may be drinking too much. We may be spending too much time in front of a screen. Those are things that we say we're doing, but Scripture also points out that sin is internal. It's inside of us. It's part of us. 
And Jesus wants us to think about what comes out of our mouth, what comes out of our minds, what comes out of our hearts, as much as what goes in. And when we look at David's psalm, when we look at what he's written, uh, uh, Reverend Elizabeth Hinson Hasty asks us to take a moment and consider what would Bathsheba's psalm read like? Sin is rarely connected to just one person. If we look at David's sin, it expanded and others were involved and impacted by it. And I want you to just take a moment and imagine what Bathsheba would write, what she would share about her experience and how she would cry out to God in a different way. Because see, when we look at the different sides to stories, there's always more than one side. And when we look at this situation, you had the powerful and the weak. You had an oppressor and the oppressed. And when we say those words, we can hear it in other places in the world. Not just in this situation with David and Bathsheba, but oppressors and oppressed, perpetrators and victims. Sin's impact doesn't end with just the individual. It goes out and it impacts others as well. And we're called to recognize that. And that is part of the reason we come together on Ash Wednesday is to recognize that our sin impacts ourselves, others, and our relationship with God. And when we are the ones who have committed that wrong, we are called to repent. And that's the first step in reconciliation. And to repent, we need to acknowledge our wrong, our sin that we've done, and we need to turn away from it. This is the other piece of repentance, is we need to turn away from it. And that we need to accept the grace that God offers because we can't fix our sin by ourselves. Try as we might. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't find much joy in admitting when I've done wrong, when I've sinned. Those are not words I like to share with others. And Ash Wednesday tends to be a somber day because of that, as we're looking at our sin and the sins of this world. But here's the thing, it's not meant to, to knock us down and hold us down. It's, it's meant to show us that God's grace is available to us and that we need to recognize that when we repent of our sin, it can liberate us from that very sin through the grace of God. And as we read through Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Yes, we hear sin, but we also find that the psalmist is full of hope and cries out to God, for God is faithful and God can wash away the sins. David was aware of the sin in his life and his brokenness, and we are as well. It is part of who we are. And when we embrace the depth of that sorrow, we can begin together this Lenten journey. And it is a full awareness of our limitations, our mortality, of our sinful nature. And we can see and be aware of it, not just in us, but in our society, in this world, we know that sin exists. And here's the thing, we may not know why and we may not know exactly what to do about it, but this sense of disconnect of what God created and what we're living, it's real. And we can't figure out how to bridge it. We heard this, because I know my wrongdoings, my sin is always right in front of me. But we have to be careful not to make the focus solely on our sin. We have to remember that it's through God's grace that forgiveness and redemption is possible. Tonight, when I impose those ashes and put them on your forehead or on your hand, you, you, you'll, you may hear me say these words. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We say those words because we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Yet, here's the thing that we have to remember that joy and hope are possible. Gladness can be heard. Bones that were broken can cry out with joy. 
Ash Wednesday is about repentance. It's about forgiveness. It's about understanding that we're called to claim a Savior. We're called to claim Jesus Christ. And this is the start of our journey to reconciliation with ourselves, with others, and with God. Reverend Catherine, Catherine Amos, she points out a few things about Psalm 51, and one of them is that it offers us an insight into a way to deepen and enhance our relationship with God. And here's what I want, here's what I want to explain what that means. We can use the psalm as a, a way to practice honest, and actually she uses the word courageous. I love that term. We can practice honest and courageous introspection. We can look at who we are and we can be in conversation with God. And it begins by being honest with ourselves. Who we are, our relationship with ourselves, how we think of ourselves, our relationship with others, how we reach out to the world, and our relationship with God. How are we connecting with God and our Savior? And as we look at this, it's not always easy. In fact, it's usually very difficult because we have to be open to who we truly are and then to take action and do something about that. And we don't do it alone, though. I invite you, as you go through that self-examination, to seek out God's assistance. Go to God in prayer, and then through that, together, each of us can come to a deeper understanding of ourselves, and the impact we have on others. See, this is a beginning of a season where we look at the internal and external signs of our penitence. What are we doing to say, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry to the person we wronged. What are we doing to say, I'm trying to do more? What is that sorrow we're showing, the regret? How are we addressing that And how are we moving forward? See, part of the problem here is the reason this is a challenge is because we live in a world where satisfying our individual desires comes first. That's what we're told to do. And we're told to do that even if it comes at the expense of others. It's all about me. That's what we're told. We see that economic motives drive actions of others and ourselves. Relationships are used to secure our own desires, fulfill our own needs. Our bodies have been turned into commodities by others. We're lured to buy more, more, more. It doesn't end. We're divided by our views. If we disagree, that means we're never going to be able to connect. That's what we're being told. And yet, Christ calls us to live in healthy relationships where differences are embraced and celebrated and show strength. And see, we need to be aware tonight that we've done wrong and we are sorry and we do want to change. We're missing out on God's hope and God's prayers for our lives. God created perfection. And only through God can we return to that. And so this evening when we mark ourselves with ashes, we're marking the beginning. This is a starting point of a commitment to find ways to participate in the restoration of relationships with ourselves, with others, and with God. as we look at our shortcomings, our sins, and we look at our community and the world and what has happened there, all of these things are designed to help us recognize that we need to move towards transformation. And as we are in Lent, and it's more and can include giving something up. Anyone here ever give something up? Chocolate. No, not going to happen. But it is something you can give up. Uh, I, I, one, uh, I gave up swearing many years ago. And that was, that was a positive. Uh, another time I gave up television. 
And my wife was my own little Nathan. She pointed out to me that I was actually just switching devices and I was spending more time on my computer or on my phone. But it is good to do that, to take something out of your life that may be causing sin to happen. But here's something I'd I'd encourage everyone to do. Rather than give something up, add something spiritual to your life. Find a way to make a new connection. Find a daily devotional and spend time with that in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, whenever works for you. If you don't have a daily devotional, let me know. Email me, call me, come see me. I have several I can share with you. Or you can simply search and find them online. They exist, you can do that. You can open up your Bible and read Scripture. You can spend time in God's Word and then reflect on what you've just read. You can pick up a book. This is what we're going to be using for our Lenten series and our small group studies. It's John, the Gospel of Light and Life by Adam Hamilton. And we will be reading the entire Gospel of John during Lent ending on Easter. So that is part of a devotional that we are going to be doing through small group and study and worship. So I invite you to do that as well. You can fast. And this can be a fast, uh, one of my favorite fasts that I hear people doing now is fasting from devices. Silencing something. Pick whatever your favorite social media app is and fasting from that for start with an hour and then grow from there or simply find time to be in prayer to spend time with God to go to God in prayer and to pray as David did connecting with God knowing that that love exists and that grace exists together as we journey through Lent. I want us all to be confident in God's love, God's compassion, God's mercy for us, and for God's continued action in this world. Let us go together to God in prayer. O Lord, our God, as we, your people, come before you in adoration, open our lips that our mouths might declare your praise. You are the God of our salvation, and our tongues will sing aloud of your deliverance, that your mercy may be known to the ends of the earth. You have called us to share what we have received at your hand, but instead of doing your works of mercy in private, We take delight in being praised by others. How much we enjoy having others see our great piety. But you, O God, have called for a true sacrifice of the heart. It seems so much easier to look holy than it is to be righteous in your sight. Create clean hearts in us, O God, and renew right spirits within us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Spirit, enable us to be truly sorry for our sins. Help us to repent of our ways and to seek only your face. Make our time of fasting a true renewal of our faith. Take our alms and transform them into acts of compassion. In this time, we recall your son's passion. We remember his suffering and death for our sake. Receive into your care this day others of your children who are suffering and dying. Give relief to those who hurt. Give calm to those whose minds are troubled. Give peace to those who are dying and have mercy on us all. O God, hear our prayers and answer them as you know is best for us. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we enter into the invitation of observance of Lenten discipline, I'd ask you to stand and we'll sing together, Give Us Clean Hands. invitation of an observant to observance of Lenten discipline dear brothers and sisters in Christ the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection and it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation during the season converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism it was also a time where persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, to observe in the name of the church, observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word to make a right beginning of repentance and a mark of our mortal nature. 
we present ourselves before our Creator and our Redeemer. Almighty God, You created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be for us a sign of our mortality and penitence, so that we may remember that only by Your gracious gift are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As we begin this journey to Easter, let us turn away from sin and go in peace. Let these ashes we wear be a symbol of your forgiveness and remind us to turn back to you, God. We ask this in the name of the Father and in the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.